Hey, everybody. Hope you're having an awesome day. Today, we're chatting with a relatively new mind on the field, a gentleman by the name of Mark Gober. Now, this guy was like a Princeton top of his class graduate, was an investment banker, young kid, became partner, all the right things happening in his career, but wasn't feeling fulfilled, started tossing around ideas of like the big questions. Why are we here? What does this all mean? The nature of reality. And uh, subsequently wound up writing like five books in five years, quit his job. Is This is like his new career path. And a very level-headed guy admits openly he does not know what this is. But he's going where the science takes him. Uh, I found him on Facebook. I thought he'd be, uh, you know, a great guest, Jason. So you'll have to trust me on today. Hope I'm not wrong. But we keep telling our audience we want to bring them upcoming minds, people they may not have known. And uh, I think you'll be impressed with uh, with Mark and how he kind of makes sense of the of the phenomenon. So well, that's, we've done a few consciousness ones lately, have we not? We did. Yeah, we did a, 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 quite a few. And I think it's it's a theme that needs to be covered um, in a little bit. We'll have an episode um, on just the philosophy of of all this and how this applies. But yeah, because we mentioned that we we cover all aspects of the phenomenon. Consciousness is obviously a big part to play in this. Uh, it's it's also a, a big part to play with the awakening of the person to the subject. I mean, our motto for the podcast is, are you paying attention? And that's really it. When somebody's when it clicks and they start paying attention, uh, that's it. It's, it's, you know, they're locked in. And that's exactly what uh, it sounds like Mark did, because five books in five years, that's that's it's not yeah, easy to write a book. Motivated. For no, sure, sure. yeah, it's complicated. And now that you know, we have guys like David Grush and you know, some of these other whistleblowers, you know, set up to talk, it's a whole other world of questions now. Mm -hmm. Like, what happens, you know, in a societal environment post disclosure? What happens to those paradigms that people have been so accustomed to if they are shattered? You know, if we do actually get confirmation that non human intelligence is a real. What are the religious and political implications of that, right? Are we ready for that sort of thing? So so that's going to be the direction we take today's show. I know it's going to be fun. We'll cover a lot of stuff in a short amount of time like we always do. And uh, thanks to our audience for all the amazing comments, the love, the feedback. Oh, we can it. honestly say yeah. we have the best audience. You guys will correct us if we make a mistake. So we know you're sharp. Probably more of you are sharper than we are. And we love having your feedback and your input. But just the sheer number of people saying, love your show. You guys are awesome. You're in my top five or you're my favorite. Like, we really appreciate that. That's why we do this. It's not for the money. It's to uh, to educate some people, give you something to ponder, do with it what you will. But uh, we're never forcing anything down your throat. Just presenting you cool ideas. We've all got to sort of make sense of this in our own roundabout way. So with that, we'll run the music, Jay, and we'll see everybody back in 26 seconds. Do this. Welcome back to another episode of UAP Studies Podcast. My name is Louis Borges. Joining me as always, my best buddy, Jason Gilmet. How's it going this weekend? Going good. You're, uh, yeah. You look like you're warm. It's pretty hot out today. It, huh? it's, it's, I'm not going to lie to you. So downstairs, uh, I have no fan, no air conditioning. I'm wearing a suit and it's hot. Yeah. I know it was like 22. This is Canadian, so it's not American, but it's like 22, which is, you know, People I think would be right thinking now, it's below zero if you tell them that, right? Fahrenheit or Celsius. That's true. Very true. But it's, it's it, yeah, it's boiling hot. So, uh, but without fail, we always wear our, our suits. So, you know, we have to, right? That's the uniform. That's the exactly. Uniform. And in keeping with that professional uh, look and discussions, we uh, we found a bright mind that we wanted to chat with. You know, typically we're interviewing scientists and big name people in the field, but there's a lot of up and coming people doing brilliant work, very well spoken. And uh, they're like us. They, they're not an expert. They don't know. They just want to learn more. And by doing their projects, this is our project, but some people write books, make movies, you know, so by doing that, it's helping them, but also helping other people understand. And uh, today's guest is uh, no different. We've got Mark Gober. He's an award winning author, uh, podcast host. He uh, also serves on the board of uh, Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell's Institute of Noetic Sciences. That's very cool. Uh, graduated magna cum laude from Princeton. I mean, he's a brilliant guy and uh, he's written five books in five years. And then as of recently, in the last few years, focus more on the UFO, UAP sort of context of things. So we're going to pick his mind about a lot of things today. But uh, first, a warm welcome to the show, Mark Gober. 
Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks for taking time out of your day to sit with us and with our audience. We really appreciate it. So for those who aren't maybe familiar with you, tell us a little bit about uh, your previous work, what you've done, and uh, what got you into this crazy field that we call UAP. Sure, I'll take you back from the beginning because I never had any expectation of becoming interested in UAPs and consciousness and things like that. So um, when I graduated from Princeton, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Many of my classmates were going into investment banking, strategy consulting. It was sort of like the thing you you were to do if you didn't have a, a career path. Um, and I figured, okay, why don't I try something like that? It might be a good basis for a business career, even though I'm not sure what I want to do long term. So I went into investment banking. And lucky for me, I graduated in 2008. So I started during the financial crisis. Oh, and good. I was at uh, one of the Perfect I was time. at one of the big investment banks in New York that was not only having problems itself, but I was in the group at the bank that was responsible for advising other banks and insurance companies and asset managers. So it was like a combined stress level of normal investment banking plus the broader recession, um, and then being in the group that advised other companies that were in distress. So it was a really tough period for me, and I didn't I knew I didn't want to do investment banking long term. Um, although I did learn a lot in that period, it was very tough. Um, I, I decided to leave in 2010 and I joined a firm where I ended up spending 10 years, uh, first in the Boston office. And then most of my time was in Silicon Valley. It was a spin out of the Boston consulting group focused on advising companies on intellectual property issues from a business lens. So it was kind of a hybrid of law and technology and business all in one, which I found to be more intellectually stimulating, but still like from a more existential perspective, I felt pretty lost. And this whole, throughout my whole journey, even in undergrad, but especially my business career, I was chasing the next thing, the next challenge in front of me. And then sometimes I would achieve it, sometimes I wouldn't. And ultimately I felt like I was on a treadmill, like I wasn't actually getting anywhere without having a, a broader sense of purpose or meaning behind it. And if I were to categorize myself at that point, I was an agnostic or an atheist. I thought life itself had no fundamental meaning. Like I could make up meaning on my own, but it didn't actually have any meaning beyond that. And I thought life was totally random and certainly spiritual ideas, notions of religion. Those were just superstitions. That was my mindset. And I thought science was taking us away from those ideas. In 2016, I, while I was still working at the firm, I wasn't a partner yet. So I was still working my way up. I eventually became a partner, but I was still very much on the career track and feeling lost and I was listening to podcasts, not looking for something life-changing, but it was just sort of like a hobby. It was They were becoming more popular at the time. Shows like Tim Ferriss were becoming popular, especially in my circles in Silicon Valley, where you could listen to a venture capitalist talk for a few hours. At the time, that was a pretty novel idea to be able to have that kind of access. So I started listening to podcasts and then um, heard a woman on a show called Extreme Health Radio talk about psychic abilities that she had and communicating with beings and other dimensions, like that sort of thing. Pretty out there. And I, it wasn't like my life changed in that moment, but I became interested enough to say, well, what's going on here? Why is this woman saying this stuff? Is she lying? Is she just delusional? Is this some kind of psychotic thing that goes on with people? I really wasn't sure. And then I ended up listening to more podcasts like that and then started to read books and then realized that there was some science to back up these concepts. And within a few months in 2016, I, I felt completely disoriented because I was confronted with this body of data and evidence that contradicted my old worldview. And it contradicted the, the worldviews of basically most people in my network. I didn't even know anyone who considered these out there topics. So I felt very alone and very lost. And at the same time, there was a liberating feel to it because I realized, wait, if there's any hint of truth to this stuff, then maybe there's a lot I have to learn about the nature of reality. Maybe there is some meaning and purpose. So I, I, the, a year later in 2017, after I had been researching continuously, because I just wanted to learn more and more, I got to the point where I thought there was something to it. And there was enough where even in my business context, I could write a book that was science-based, that that suggested that my old world worldview was incorrect. And by proxy, the worldview of mainstream science is incorrect. So that's my first book called An End to Upside-Down Thinking. And that was actually published in 2018. 
In 2019, I continued on that theme of wanting to challenge the scientific paradigm, but I interviewed many of the scientists that I had written about. And that's my podcast series called Where Is My Mind? It's an eight episode series. It's it's not ongoing, but that it's still out there on Apple Podcasts and all the major players, but it explores the same question. Like what's the nature of reality? Is there more than meets the eye? And I think there is a lot of evidence and to, to hear it from the scientists' voices, it's a little bit different than just reading a book where you're reading my quotes of them. I wanted to do a different medium. So that took me to the end of 2019. I had become a partner at the firm. I was on a really good track. Um, great colleagues, really interesting client work. And if you had given me that, that position when I graduated from college, I would have said, wow, I'm in a great spot. Like relatively young to be in a partner at a, at a firm that I like. I understand this somewhat niche area, but it's also not niche because it applies to every industry in terms of intellectual property and technology. Great spot objectively from, from my old lens, but then I had this passion for trying to understand what's going on in the universe. <laughs> Who are we? Why are we here? And so I felt pulled where I, for a few years, I was kind of parallel tracking where I was I would do my client work, but then when I wasn't doing client work, I wanted to just focus on this other stuff. And it became too hard to do that in parallel. So I decided to leave the firm without knowing what would be next. And I didn't know COVID was going to happen and the lockdowns and everything. So it was interesting timing that basically I was transitioning out of my job as the lockdowns were hitting. I wrote my second book right before the lockdowns in 2020. So I'd already given notice to my firm, but I was working part-time to help transition out. It's a book called An End to Upside Down Living. And it talks more about the implications for approaching life with this new paradigm, which we'll get into. And then um, as I started to watch the world unfold, um, became interested in the political spectrum, which was something that was not part of my radar. So in 2021, I wrote a book called An End to Upside Down Liberty. And part of what I was interested in is not only just like traditional politics and economics, which is certainly part of that book, but I wanted to understand those areas within the context of metaphysics, of what is this universe that we're, we're in and how does that inform how we should structure society? One of the things that I mentioned in that book, but to kind of leave it open-ended, is to say, well, if, if there is this metaphysical reality of more than meets the eye, could it be that our power structures are being influenced by forces that we don't see? And I kind of left it there. And I said, look, normally tradi traditional political theory is not looking at that angle. And that leads me into my the fourth book, An End to Upside Down Contact, which looks at the evidence that human beings are not alone, that there is other intelligence out there and that there's dark light, light within that realm. Um, and, and that also leads into my fifth book, An End to the Upside Down Reset, which is looking at the direction of our society, the World Economic Forum's Great Reset. And I also address this idea of what I call a spiritual war of, of forces that are out there that are directing our society. Some would probably want society to be more peaceful and others the opposite. So hopefully you can tell from just my interests, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to fundamental questions about our existence. So what is a human being? Why do we exist? How did our society get to be to the point where it is now? And what should our direction be going forward? Right. And there's a lot of like philosophy that goes along with this whole, I would say genre of study, but basically uh, um, to realize that we, we live in a time where we need to pay attention more than we've ever had. I think we're more consciously aware that we're not alone, that obviously something's going on. Culturally, we're more accepting, but we've never been more divided, I think, as a people globally. Even if you think about what's going on in your country right now, Mark, uh, just the polarization that everybody is in disagreement and totally at war with one another. And it, it's not good. Like this is, we focus so much on the human crap, you know, our, our politics. And like you were mentioning your work, your work was, it's all human made. It's not part of the universe. You know, it's not contributing anything to the universe. Mm -hmm. And it's true. It's a realization that we all have at some point where it kicks. I used to be an insurance uh, before and it was the same thing. It was like this is not fulfilling. Like, how is this fulfilling? I'm just doing human crap. There's bigger questions out there that I would like to pursue, and it's the same for anybody, even uh, Louis. Like, you know, he's just his day to day job. He's focused on that. And all of a sudden, he starts thinking outside the box, and it changes. There's a paradigm shift. In as a man, I can't speak as you know as a woman, but as a man, it changes your philosophy. You're all messed up. You're like, how does this apply to this? Like. How, what was the process like for you, Mark, when you went through that? Was it like messy or is it something that you just gradually grew into? 
Yeah, messy. And I would say it's ongoing. I don't feel like I'm complete. I don't know if there is a completion to it. It feels like there's an infinite process of learning and evolution. But it was messy in that I had to do what you just described, Jason, recontextualize all the assumptions in my life that I previously had, because now I had a new metaphysics, a new worldview to rethink all these things that I used to believe were true. And now I'm like, wait, is it exactly true in the way that I thought? Well, I have a new worldview. Maybe it fits in differently to my life. And maybe the way I would describe my basic process is I'm challenging assumptions because now now that my basic worldview about the nature of reality has shifted, um, I'm asking myself, how do I know the things that I think I know to be true? Right. Like I'm not taking anything for granted anymore. And then I, I get to the point where I realize, wait a second, I don't know this for sure. I, I believe X, Y, and Z to be true because I was told it at a certain age and like the media told me, but wait, how do I know that those things are true? And that's the process I continue to go through, which is inherently disruptive because it feels like my books all start with an end to upside down something. And when I started writing, I didn't know I was going to write more than one book. It just turns out that everything seems to be upside down, all the paradigms that I used to hold. And that is inherently messy and uncomfortable, but I've gotten more accustomed to it of like, I come across a new paradigm that I question and I say, okay, I've been through this before. I don't even believe anything basically. So, okay, what's another one? Yeah, right. And that's sort of the inverted reality I've heard you mention before, where the things you think you know may not be correct, and, and you don't realize it until you challenge the sort of base of that and go, well, why is that even in my mind? Like, if the initial information was flawed, I've just been living sort of falsities my whole life. And for me personally, that happened going down the rabbit hole, so to speak, of the whole UFO, UAP topic. It used to be fairly nuts and bolts, craft, the idea of aliens. But I'm also a science major and, you know, I did a lot of work um, studying quantum entanglement and physics and all the rest. I'm also a spiritual guy. So I always saw there was a divide between religion and science. And it didn't make any sense to me because I'm thinking, well, the more science discovers, the more proof of the amazing creator. You know, it doesn't seem like they're opposites at all. And it really started when I started pondering consciousness. Like, what is consciousness? You know, is it something that's localized? Uh, you know, where does it exist? Is this like stuff that you read about on the Planck scale and things like that? And, you know, the kind of the, the more people we speak to about it consciousness wise, it seems to come back to the body is a vessel. The brain is either your transmitter, receiver, both. But consciousness is external. It is not localized with us. We download from that. And all these sort of, um, you know, enriching or enhanced consciousness experiences, hypnagogic states or meditation or kundalini, they seem to, to prove that, that you're in this physical world observing with your senses and all of a sudden something magic, inspiration or, to you know, in spirit can just find you. So I wanted to get your opinion on sort of the whole consciousness play in relation to UFOs, UAP, even the way people communicate sometimes the stories you read, it's all telepathic and seems more consciousness than nuts and bolts. So what are mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, this notion of consciousness or what you're describing, non-local consciousness, is central to all of the work that I've been doing. My first book focuses on this exclusively, but then I've applied it to UAP and politics and all those things. And I, I think when considering the phenomenon of, are we alone? Are there other beings? Are there crafts? I'm I'm with you, Louis, that it's not just nuts and bolts. I think there is a physical element to pay attention to. But one of the reasons I call my my fourth book an end to upside down contact is the notion that it's exclusively physical to me is upside down, is that yeah. there is this consciousness element to it too, which is not just some secondary thing. To me, it's central to the phenomenon. And I want to double click on what you were describing around the nature of consciousness, because this will really flow into everything else we discuss. The, the mainstream paradigm in academia and largely in the media and education system is the idea that consciousness comes from the brain. It's known as scientific materialism or physicalism. And that was my old worldview. If you believe that to be true, then psychic phenomena, what? how could that be true? How could you have a non-local consciousness? No, it's stuck in your skull. Survival of consciousness when the body dies. How could that happen? If the brain's creating consciousness, when you shut off the brain, that's the end of consciousness. Reincarnation. That would be impossible if the brain creates consciousness. So when you start to challenge that assumption, does the brain create consciousness? It opens up all sorts of things. It opens up other dimensions of experience. It opens up other beings that might exist in a non-physical form because their consciousness wouldn't be dependent on a body, for example. And I also want to mention that, that even mainstream science acknowledges that it doesn't understand consciousness. 
it believes as an assumption and as really an inference that the brain creates it only because the brain is correlated with conscious experience. If someone gets in a car accident, for example, and has damage to a part of the brain that's responsible for vision or memory, the person might actually have a change in their vision and memory. And we can say, look, this is the part of the brain that changed. This is how their consciousness changed. Now, why is that not sufficient to then say, well, the brain must create consciousness? It's because of the adage, correlation does not imply causation. Just because two things are related doesn't automatically mean that one causes the other. And a philosopher who talks about this stuff is Dr. Bernardo Castrop. He's given an analogy where he says, look, you have a fire and firefighters show up. You have a larger fire. There are lots of firefighters that show up. There's a strong correlation between the size of the fire and the number of firefighters that appear. And then he asks the question, should we assume that firefighters are causing the fires? Right. That's not the, it's not necessarily the relationship. There's another way to explain it. So Louis, what you're talking about is, well, maybe the brain is related to consciousness, but it's a receiver transmitter. Mm -hmm. Another theory is that the brain is a filtering mechanism, that it's getting in the way of a broader reality, that the brain is like a blindfold. And when you get the blindfold out of the way, then wow, there's much more out there. And going back to Dr. Kastrup, he uses this analogy of um, saying that all of reality is one universal consciousness. And you could liken that to a stream of water where each of us is in a whirlpool within that stream. So we have the sense of being an individual, but we're fundamentally interconnected. And that's my general metaphysics now, because I think there's a lot of evidence to, to suggest that's true. But from the perspective of UAPs, you know, if I'm a whirlpool, you're a whirlpool, Louis, you're a whirlpool, James. What's going on in the stream that we're not seeing with our with our ordinary perception? We see this in a near death experience, for example, when a person has little or no brain functioning, and yet they have an experience that is realer than real, and they encounter beings, they encounter intelligences, whether they're deceased relatives, they might be beings that they would call spiritual. They might say it was a being of light. It might be a religious figure. But these are intelligences that they're interacting with. And when I interviewed Dr. Bruce Grayson from the University of Virginia, who studies these near-death experiences, he said, Mark, we're left with this paradox that at a time when the brain isn't functioning, the mind is functioning better than ever. And this is just one of many phenomena that could be explained if consciousness is actually beyond the brain and the brain is a limiter. So it raises the question with regard to the, the contact phenomenon broadly, what exists out there that we are not ordinarily perceiving with our perceptual organs. Our eyes can only see a limited part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Our ears only hear so much. Our, our senses do not tell us everything. What else is out there beyond it? And it opens up the possibility to many phenomena. Right. Which, and that's always bugged me because, I mean, people can't seem to think outside the box. I mean, repeatedly over history, we always had somebody come up and say, actually, you know, the earth isn't flat, it's round. How dare you? We couldn't wrap our heads around it. People died. Uh, same when we said, you know, the, the planet goes around the sun, not the sun goes around the planet. How dare you? People died. Uh, this always happens whenever there's a, a shift in our thinking or our understanding of the universe. Even now with uh, the Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope, I mean, we're capturing things that are amazing in space that should really all blow our minds and just say how tiny we are and insignificant daily life of a human is compared to the grand scheme of things. But we have a hard time wrapping our heads around, well, the possibility of them being here. That's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're at the top of the food chain. Have you seen us? And I always thought that that idea is arrogantly ignorant. It's not paying attention to the bigger picture because we mentioned this a few times on the podcast that, you know, if you have a chimpanzees are starting to come to uh, the age of the Stone Age, right? They're learning how to use tools and stuff. And we're observing that. What if a species already did that to us? What if we evolved and they watched us? They were the same as us before. But now they're, they progress to a point where we still can't see them. We don't understand them. Same as a chimpanzee could see, you know, crafts flying above them like airplanes and stuff occasionally they have interactions with humans it's the same thing with these entities it's just that we have a hard time understanding we're at the bottom of the totem pole and not as high as we thought we were that's the biggest thing for humans to wrap their heads around with it's our ego and we have it everywhere in our religion it's all centered around us the gods are all for us you know they do all these things for us it's always us 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 and i think that's the biggest issue in our species. It's constantly just thinking of ourselves as individuals and then just as a species. Second, 
Um, and, and that's what I'm blown away by when somebody like yourself is just like, whoa, like you start going down that, that rabbit hole, it opens up your mind to realize that maybe we've been lied to, or maybe we're just not aware of the situation, but we need to be right. We need to start paying attention and say, there's a bigger picture here. So yeah, my, my hat's off to you, Mark, for being able to do that because it, it, it is a rabbit hole and it does take its toll, right? <laughs> yeah. What did you find like in the subject of ufology or this field of study? What did you find the most interesting? When I decided I was going to write the book, um, an end to upside down contact, I spent a lot of time looking at the abduction phenomenon and John Mack's work, who was the head of psychiatry at Harvard, Pulitzer Prize winner. And he was talking to these people and he was concluding that they were not psychotic, that they had real experiences. So I spent a lot of time looking at that and I said, okay, there's a book here in addition to a lot of the consciousness stuff. And I, I had done some study on research on psychedelics, um, like Rick Strassman's work. But as I dug into it further, I didn't realize that there was a connection between the abduction phenomenon and DMT until I got into it deeply. So I'll, I'll mention this now because it was one of those things where it, it, it solidified things for me in a new way when I hit that research. So Rick Strassman's work on DMT, dimethyltryptamine, this is a hardcore psychedelic compound, which is found in nature and found in the body. Um, it's typically, like ayahuasca, right? Ayahuasca is DMT? Yes. Yeah. Ayahuasca is a, a plant brew that keeps the DMT active in the body so that people have tri a trip. Essentially, they're experiencing outside their whirlpool, so to speak, other dimensions for an extended period of time. Typically the DMT is just broken down in the body. But in Rick Strassman's study from the University of New Mexico, he was giving it intravenously. So this was kind of an unnatural way of giving people this hardcore psychedelic and they were having all kinds of experiences in other dimensions, encountering entities, but they were having experiences that sounded just like abductions. But the kicker here is that Strassman didn't really know much about abductions. And he said some of his participants didn't know about abductions. And they were describing similar stuff where they're like being operated on or very strange types of beings, different uh, species of intelligence. And then John Mack actually endorsed Rick Strassman's book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, because he was seeing the stuff outside the DMT context. And so that was a mind blower for me because these seemed like, I mean, somewhat interconnected areas, but pretty distinct. And for these two people to independently arrive at this phenomenon which, I mean, talk about a paradigm shifter, the notion that people could be abducted, whether it's just their consciousness or their body, that's a debate, but they would have experiences with seemingly non-human intelligences where they're being operated on. I mean, John Mack's work talks about um, people having sperm and eggs being taken and actually encountering hybrid beings, like their hybrid children on these crafts and whatnot. And that there is a relationship to the phenomenon of consciousness. I mean, this is just one finding out of many, but it's like, you don't hear people talk about that very often, certainly in the mainstream, but it's, it's a bombshell. Yeah. And previously, uh, earlier in the show, I heard you mention that there may be light and dark out there. Mm -hmm. And immediately what came to my mind is the recent Stephen Greer disclosure event that he had. And again, regardless of your opinion of Stephen Greer, but one of the statements he made is that there are no malevolent beings. Mm -hmm. They're all good. And to me, that seems kind of like a blanket statement. Like, we don't know for sure that they're all good or all bad. So you have to kind of have a say, this is just my opinion, and I'm sure many others share the same, but you have to have a healthy appreciation of the fact that we don't know what we don't know. And it's that type of blanketing of things to just make it all neat and tidy that prevents us from moving forward, right? So like you can't, just because the truth might be inconvenient and doesn't line up with your way of thinking doesn't mean you throw it out. Maybe that is the truth and it's your paradigm that needs to correct itself. So what are your thoughts on the whole, if there are non-human intelligences, are they all friendly space brothers here to help us? Because the biggest defense of that argument is if alien, and I've said it myself, if aliens were bad, why didn't they turn us into slaves years ago or blow us up? Mm -hmm. But that's a very human way of looking at something that they probably would perceive totally differently because of their level of understanding of the cosmos. So what are your thoughts on good versus bad ET? Sure. This is a really important point. I do focus on it in the book and into Upside Down Contact. And I've listened to about a half of Dr. Greer's new conference. And I noted that same point, Louis, where he said that he thinks the beings are all benevolent. I don't know Dr. Greer personally, but in my own research, it's it seems based on the evidence that not all non-human intelligences are benevolent. People have encountered beings who are not 
who seem to do not, they don't have humans best interests at heart. That, that, that just comes up over and over again. Now it depends on how you define the word alien. And I know some people have different definitions. I'm talking about non-human intelligence broadly, whether they're physical beings, non-physical beings, that entire category. So I don't know if Dr. Greer was just talking about one category or other categories, because I think I've heard him say various things. In my view, non-human intelligence is not exclusively benevolent and not exclusively malevolent. There seem to be both. And like, for example, in the book, and into Upside Down Contact, I talk about um, invocations of evil, which is a topic I don't see covered everywhere, partially because it's so dark. It's um, I won't go into the gory details, but it's like where people do rituals to try to invoke dark beings and they do it for purposes of power or whatever. And they end up doing like horrific things, like unimaginable evil to other humans or animals or children. And some people who have survived those abuses, some of them I've even spoken to, um, but some of them have have recorded that they, they beings showed up in those ceremonies. They encountered dark beings, like actual forces that were real and they were intelligent. So that's like one e example uh, of the extreme. But then in a near-death experience state, for example, people's, at least their, their experience is extremely benevolent where it's unconditional love. That's the experience they have where they're transformed. And there are people like uh, Ray Hernandez's free study. And also Dr. Kenneth Ring has done studies comparing near-death experiences to contact phenomena and the after effects. And in many cases, people end up having spiritual transformations, which seems to be like net positive. Even though, though there might be some trauma in the mix, they end up having a net positive, like benevolent transformation. Whereas in these very dark rituals, it seems net negative where the person's horribly traumatized and maybe they get lucky to be able to overcome it. But it's this, it's this traumatic thing to overcome what happened to them at, at different points in their life. So I, I do think there's a spectrum. That's my short version. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Like anything, right? There's going to be good. There's going to be bad. Although 90% of people that have had an abduction experience say that it was somehow positive. Even Whitley Strieber, he doesn't think they're his friends because he's like, friends don't come to your house and assault you without your you know, permission. But he also admits that they've somehow helped him. And mm. so it's a it's a strange relationship between it's almost like what do they call that uh, Copenhagen syndrome or the one where uh, or Stockholm, Stockholm syndrome, Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you you know, you become abused so long, you start to love the abuser and just accept what's happening. Right. It's almost like maybe that's their their input as well. Maybe that's how it's supposed to go. And there is some influence in that, too. Who knows? Well, here's where I get tripped up. The, the fact that these beings seem to have an ability to alter human consciousness, which means if you take that literally, that we can't trust memory fully. So there's the phenomenon of screen memories. Mike Clellan's work, for example, where he's looked at like owl, uh, owls and other animals that seem to co-occur with um, contact phenomena. Sometimes people will say, well, I saw an owl and then I had missing time for a few hours. Then they try to recover memories under hypnosis and they're asked to see what the owl looked like. To, to get more detail on that time. And they'll realize, wait a second, that wasn't an owl. That's a gray alien. Mm -hmm. And so the memory was implanted. So if you take that to be true, it's like, well, how do we trust these experiences? Maybe some of the benevolent ones are screen memories of benevolence. I mean, we can't rule that out. Yeah. And then uh, people report being switched off. I mean, Ray Hernandez tells the personal story where his dog was being healed and he like basically walked downstairs and then almost in a hypnotic state, like left the event as his dog was being healed by an orb of light or something. So it seemed actually to be a benevolent event because the dog was healed, but he was switched. His consciousness was switched off for a period of time. There's this ability to manipulate. And it makes me just question. Like I don't, I don't, when I said earlier, I don't believe anything. I mean that I don't, I don't feel like I conclusively know anything for sure. I have belief with, with regard to probabilities, but I don't know for sure because of if we can't trust our memory then how do we really know anything? Yeah. Well, the part that scares me about the consciousness aspect is that if they're able to manipulate it, turn it off, do whatever they want with it, is it really ours to begin with? Because we have no control over it. They have absolute control over the consciousness aspect. People say that all the time. It's a violation of not only your physical being, but every essence of who you are, including the consciousness and all that. It's invasive. They control it. There's nothing you can do about it. And I always thought that was fascinating because it's like, well, what does that mean for us? Does it mean that we have any control over this? Are we just not educated on how to control it? Or do they have supreme control if they want to? Which, if you think about it, I can understand from a military logistics how terrifying that is that alien or 
a non-human intelligence can just shut off everybody in the military. Nobody move. Nobody do anything. And that's scary because it doesn't matter what weapons you have. If you encap, inca- uh, I have a hard time with that word, incapacitate uh, the military for say, I have to say slowly there. If you, uh, if you do that to the military, um, you know, they're not going to move. They're not going to do anything. The weapons are useless. So that's the part that always scares me is the, the aspect of consciousness and being able to, do you have any control over it? Is it something that's just aloof that, something that's a little bit more higher in intelligence than us is able to control. Uh, When you dig into this, Mark, like, have you come across this? Have you any cases related to that where somebody's consciousness is completely controlled? Hmm. Well, you're reminding me of a study that Dean Radin did. He's the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. He wrote a book called Super Normal, and he was looking at um, like cities, these are in the in the Vedic uh, Indian tradition. These are extreme abilities that emerge, psychic abilities that emerge when you reach an elevated state of consciousness. And he was doing a study on uh, a man named Swami Veda, who was entering a state, like I guess a meditative state, and was trying to alter reality in some way. And that's what Dean Radin was studying. But when Swami Veda got into one of these high states and was altering reality the cameraman and Dean Radin himself, they had an alteration in their own consciousness where they sort of went switched off. So the, Dean asked him afterwards, asked Swami Veda, what ha- what was going on when you were trying to manipulate reality? And he said, basically, I went into my heart, something along those lines. So he elevated his consciousness and it affected other people around him. And I, it didn't seem like he was actively trying to alter their consciousness, but maybe the field shifted because this guy got entered an elevated state. So there's something about the way in which each of us alters our own mind is affecting the broader reality. And related to that, what I'm wondering is if human beings are just at a relatively low level of consciousness where we have such little control over our own minds that we're more susceptible to this stuff from outside forces. Whereas people who work with meditation and other exercises to really control their mind, maybe they're more able to exert um, force over the reality rather than things being exerted on them. Good point. Good Good point. point. I've got a friend who's a trained remote viewer and I'm fascinated by it. The idea that you can use consciousness and go through place and time and actually interact with beings. And to your point about being more of a trained person, having the the ability to get into that realm versus somebody who, you know, maybe doesn't because the average person doesn't meditate and they find it difficult even to get into that state to get any real effect. A lot of people stop trying because they don't really feel anything. Right. So um, the whole idea of, um, uh, remote viewing and everything else. Like, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? A, is it possible? And B, is it something we should mess with? Because I asked my mm. friend, teach me, and he goes, you don't want to go there. He goes, you know, we know of the hitchhiker effect. When you play with these things, even if you are higher vibrational energy, you get stuff that you don't expect, right? We are the lesser species here. You shouldn't go messing with things. And even some professionals who've been doing this for 15 years, they seek the help of other professionals to help them rid the sort of garbage they've picked up on the way. So what are your whole thoughts of uh, getting into that realm of, you know, remote viewing or or trying to seance with these things, so to speak? To me, the phenomena are real. And I want to talk about that in a minute, but I agree with you, Louis, that I, I personally don't feel qualified to deal with these other realms because I think there's a mixed bag of stuff. And if you don't know what you're dealing with, then you can get into trouble. And yeah. even in the in the Vedic tradition, uh, people are warned when they get these cities, when they get these special abilities, as their consciousness evolves, they're they're warned not to become attached to the talent because the talent or whatever the ability is, it comes basically through the universe and it's given to them as a gift. And when they become attached to it, it's like an ego attachment, and then it can lead to really bad things because they start to. It starts to manipulate their own enlightenment, so to speak. But also when you're literally dealing with other dimensions, there are other beings there that people report. And it's like, do you want to mess with that? Um, I mean, with regard to remote viewing, to me, it's real. Um, I, I've cited this in my books. There are declassified documents from the CIA that say remote viewing is a real phenomenon. Implications are revolutionary, like direct quotes. I interviewed Russell Targ uh, for my podcast series. He was one of the leaders of the U.S. government psychic spying program in the 1970s. Um, and I've, I've talked to many other people that were involved in the program. And to them, it's not, is it real or not? It's more of how should we be using it and what are the dangers, but what are also the benefits of it? Um, in my own experience, I've just been hesitant because um, the more I learn, the more I feel like there are dangers. And I, I actually cite 
a man named John Vivanco, who's done remote viewing for all sorts of projects, uh, FBI, but also corporate stuff. And he told the story of doing, um, it was a remote viewing project where he ended up coming across um, seemingly alien beings that noticed his consciousness effectively. And then the beings visited him <laughs> like he was sleeping one night and then they showed up and said they wanted stuff from him and they wanted his help with stuff. So that's just one example of, well, they weren't trying to mess with these beings, but they were doing a remote viewing project. Their consciousness went, went somewhere non-locally where other beings existed and you entered their space. And all of a sudden he entered, he was in this relationship that he wasn't expecting. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh unforeseen dating. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, <laughs> no, but like, even with the consciousness, because people were saying that too, that these entities know where you are at all times. Like even abductees, um, you know, will move around the country and it seems like their experiences follow them. It's like these entities, whatever they are, know where you are at all times. Um, even we're talking with Kathleen Martin and she said that, um, during one of the experiences they had told Betty Hill that, uh, basically they can find anybody they want to at any point in time. Like if you go about, it doesn't matter. They'll find you. And that's always interesting. It's almost like we have a, a unique signature to our essence or to our, our, our person, which they're really like the whole relationship between the abductee and these entities is not just physical, spiritual, the enlightened, the, the abductees, the abductees, a lot of the time have abilities. They come back, they're able to do, amazing things or get an interest in something that is not something that you ever would have been interested in before. So it's almost like there's a, a beneficial aspect to these interactions. Not all the time. Sometimes it could be very negative, but a lot of people have, you know, they become writers or, you know, they get into art, they get into music. A lot of people we interview, they're all, they're all musicians, but they're all into ufology. So it's amazing how creative people seem to have more of a, the tendency towards ufology or having contact with these entities. It's rare that you'll ever have an abductee that's like, I don't like to do anything. I just sit at home. Every once in a while, they come pick me up. That's not, I've never seen that. I've never seen somebody who's not engaged in something. These people are very active cerebrally. Like they're, they're very, you know, they're doing something with their lives, which is very interesting because it's from all walks of lives, judges, nurses, police officers, but they all have something to them that is unique that I could see like, you know, why an entity would be interested in them specifically. I don't understand, but they all have abilities um, in your research. Have you come across anything like that where somebody was just amazing uh, at an ability or something after an experience that they've had? Hmm. Well, I, I'm not thinking of a specific case, but I, I've done a lot of research on the trends. And I mentioned Dr. Kenneth Ring's work because he talks about the near death experience and the contact phenomenon and the similarities. And many times there are these after effects of becoming more interested in spirituality, also having difficulty around electronics where electronics don't work as well. So there's something about entering a spiritually transformative dimension that changes people forever in a way that a, just a hallucination wouldn't, where their life is literally redirected in a way that you're describing, Jason, where I think there's a sense of purpose that enters their life where they just they can't sit around anymore because they look at reality differently. They see right. themselves as part of this reality and therefore they want to have an impact. And if we go back to the analogy of the brain as a filtering mechanism, these spiritually transformative experiences seem to unlock the filter in a way that they're getting information and perhaps abilities through that, whether it's art or music or healing abilities. We see that sometimes. Sometimes people are even healed. Preston Dennett wrote a whole book on this where he chronicles different examples of contact phenomena where there was healing that came from it. So it's like things open up when people have any type of experience along these lines. Yeah. And I mean, there's actual real science to back that up. When we had uh, Dr. Gary Nolan on the show, mm -hmm. he was talking about doing brain scans and looking at, I think it's called the pitamen, some part of the brain in the, in the basal ganglia, but basically that is the switched on. So when they do a brain scan of somebody who's had an experience, there are parts of the brain that are active that the average person may not have active. And it's a similar part of the brain with um, like savants or people that are, um, you know, can meditate at a very deep level. And, you know, they can be by all appearances unconscious, but their brain is on fire with activity. So there may actually be physical science to say that these experiences enhance the brain 
or by you voluntarily going into that world and sort of training your talent, you can do that yourself. You don't need that external influence. So maybe there is some common ground of us meeting at a higher level with these beings. We don't know. But but on that point, earlier in the show, you mentioned that you wonder if there are outside forces potentially manipulating everything we think of as being real. And I mean, you look at ancient texts and ancient stories, there's depictions of that. And then if you think about like religious and political things, it, maybe the government is a little more aloof about this because there's that power dynamic they're going to lose, that we aren't the dominion. It's not the heads of church and state anymore that you need to listen to. We're just small fish. So what do you think about the idea that outside influences are, are you know, manipulating our day to day and, you know, uh, they have more kind of maybe nefarious plans behind all this that we're unaware of. We're busy warring with each other. Maybe that's a construct from outside influence. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I do think that they're, that we're being influenced. And going back to something you said earlier, the notion that like, well, if there were dark forces, why wouldn't we have just been blown up already? Why wouldn't we be fully enslaved? Why could it be that we're free enough to even have this conversation? To me, that's a symptom of the dark and light. The fact that it's not all dark, that there is a counter counteracting force that is preventing full enslavement. And I think it's like incumbent upon each of us to tap into either of those forces. I feel like we have a choice of where we devote our energy to the dark or to the light, because you can have a spiritual orientation and say, well, I want to use this for power. And that's what happens in some of these dark rituals where they're doing essentially black magic, horrific things, but it's for their own power. So they're consciously saying, I acknowledge spirituality, but I'm just going to choose the dark. People choose the light as well. And then the question becomes beyond that, what's going on beyond our consent? And that's what I, I feel like I don't have a great grasp on it. There's so many examples where like Robert Hastings's work on UFOs and nukes, where he looked at over 150 examples of people that were at nuclear weapons facilities and the weapons were turned on and off without their consent. Um, Louis, you mentioned historical examples. I mean, there's so many. Um, Ezekiel's vision where there's a fiery chariot and the creatures that he talks about. People have interpreted biblical, other biblical texts, like the, the idea that human or Adam is... Uh, a creation, a genetic creation. I mean, there, there's example after example. If you look at ancient mythology, religious text, where some people might say, well, that's just superstition. Others would say, no, that was a literal event. And they just use language that makes it sound like it was some mythical creature, but actually it was some force. Um, there's the work also of Dr. Artie Sixkiller Clark, who's looked at indigenous cultures, Native Americans, and other cultures all over the world. And they're talking about the sky gods and the star people that were interacting. So there's story after story of interactions with other beings, intelligent beings impacting our world. How's that happening in the world today? I don't really know, but it seems like there is dark and light and lots of turmoil where forces are influencing us. And what I'm starting to wonder, this goes back to my earlier point of, of being able to control our own mind and, and consciously point our consciousness in a certain direction, like orienting our compass, so to speak. The more we can do that in the direction of the positive, maybe the world will manifest as a byproduct in a more positive direction. And what we're seeing right now is essentially the effect of our collective consciousness, where many of us are not tapping into the good, where we're tapping into more chaotic energies. And, and it's because of, let's say, a lots of trauma that's occurred and a trauma that hasn't been cleaned up. There are many potential reasons where we, we are, we're focusing our antenna in a certain direction and we're tapping into forces sometimes without even recognizing it. Yeah, just your energy, your overall, uh, you know, emotions and uh, your your state of mind has a lot to do with how you perceive the world and how the world perceives you. Like if you change your mind, it's it's crazy. But, you know, I wake up some mornings, I'm in a you know, shitty mood. Kids are driving me nuts and I'm late for work or whatever. But that's all a mind shift. If I can shift my mind while I'm driving to work and say, no, this is going to be a good day. I'm going to be productive. My whole mood changes. And by the time I walk through the door, I'm not the same person. But there's an energy shift there. Um, speaking of which, with the energy shift, I'm just curious. Do you Have you looked into CE5 at all? Like uh, initiated contact with humans and, and telepathically or with consciousness? And uh, do you believe in that? I'm still on the fence about it personally, Mark. But I'm always fascinated by the subject because some people are saying that it's effective and that it works. Yeah, I've heard people say that it works, that it's effective. I haven't looked at it too much because I'm personally not that interested in it because I, I don't, I don't trust it. I, I don't deny that it's real to be able to invoke spirits or bring things in. I, I think consciousness is, is powerful, 
and it can do that sort of thing. And there's a lot of evidence for it, but is it something that we should be doing? Should we be playing with it in the same way that people question Ouija boards and right. you could tap into dark and light? I just don't know enough. And I feel like it's playing with fire. And that's, that's my naive response. It might be that I'm just not advanced enough and you sure you certainly can bring in benevolent beings, but I'm just not qualified. Yeah. There seems to be a trickster element to this too. Like some of these abductions, some people that kind of play with Ouija boards or whatever, you think you're talking to a loved one that's deceased, but it's not. There's a lot of, it's like the vibrational energy. If you're dwelling in the realm of sort of poltergeist, people say that after they do their exercise, they just feel drained. They feel like they got bags of cement on their shoulders. It was a heavy experience. Whereas somebody who had an abduction experience or somebody had an enlightened meditation, it feels like energetic and light. And there's a definite distinction in the vibrational energy. So, and again, too, I think that coincides with a lot of what religious texts have told us that there is an element of free will. There's heaven or hell or, you know, light or dark or yin or yang or however you want to look at that dichotomy. But there is that dualism in the world, right? Like we still exist in a place where, there are things that could happen and you can't necessarily trust that. So I, I like your point, what you said there, that CE5 is possible to invoke these things, but you don't really know what you're getting, right? Are you getting false experiences, screen memories? Are you sort of opening up a can of worms that you got no business opening up? And it, it kind of goes from there. In fact, we interviewed a guy named Jimmy Blanchett, who's taken that one step further. And he's a science major. He's a professional chemist, but he thinks that and not only is it possible, but you can do it using technology. You don't have to be a meditative savant. You can literally mm -hmm. send your, your petition into the atmosphere with radio waves. These things will pick it up and manifest. And if you're sort of worthy of heart and a lot of CE5 groups around the world will give him a message, he'll encode like a picture or like a paragraph into radio waves broadcast it and it's basically hey we're in australia if it's safe and appropriate we'd love for you to join us and these people are reporting that more things are happening at these events because he's sending an actual radio transmission and he even bounces it off the moon because then it scatters right it's kind of mm. kind of science fiction but there's video and, and like science and and all the rest to back up that it's actually there so who knows right you, you don't want to mess with it but J to Jason's point, you manifest what you put out. So if the entire world's focusing on malevolent beings, don't be surprised if that's all you seem to you know, have show up in the world because you kind of make that vacuum a possibility and then those things can fill that vacuum that you've created, right? Yeah. I, I want to harken back to the notion of trickster beings too because I, I do think there are people that can have a positive intent and still somehow something gets lost in translation and a deceptive being can come in. In my second book called An End to Upside Down Living, I talk about the spiritual awakening journey and I have a chapter called Cautions. And this was before I spent too much time on like UFOs. It was certainly like something I looked at, but I wasn't thinking about it from this context. I, I talk about a woman who was channeling beings and channeling means that essentially if the brain's an antenna, you're tapping into the con the consciousness of a being that is no longer in a body, like another whirlpool in the stream, a multidimensional stream. You're tapping into some other intelligence and that being can speak through your vocal cords. And this has been studied scientifically. So Dr. Helene Wabe at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, director of research, she wrote a book called The Science of Channeling. They've done research to look at symptoms of people with um, psychiatric disorders versus someone who's channeling and find that it's distinct. They've actually also put random number generator machines in the, in the room with the person when they're allegedly channeling and the machines behave non-randomly during the channeling, meaning mm -hmm. that there's some kind of energy that's coming in. I give the preface to say that Maybe some people are not are, are charlatans, but some people are legitimately channeling beings. I gave an example in this book, An End to Upside Down Living, of a woman who was channeling beings. They were giving her advice on her life. And then it came to the point where um, they wanted her to leave her job. And she was like, I don't know if this is such a good decision. Like, it seems like previously they were giving her some good advice, but this she wasn't sure about. She decided to do it and she said it was a horrible decision. So she shouldn't have done it. The beings gave her bad advice. And then she said, the being started laughing and said, you should kill yourself. So these were deceptive trickster beings that she was not able to discern at that time. So it's like, there's probably a spectrum of, if you put out a really good intention, maybe you do attract positive beings. If you put out a negative intention, maybe you, you attract the dark beings. And then there's this middle ground where maybe you don't, there's a blind spot that you have where the being can deceive you. And that's where I get really concerned because it's we can't see these beings often. I mean, sometimes you can, but sometimes you can't. 
and they're bringing in information. And just because they're accurate and intelligent, we shouldn't always equate that with benevolence. Right. Yeah. No, it, you know, the subject is fascinating because it encompasses so many different aspects of what it means to be human. This will enter a political realm at some point. It'll become part of the political party's agenda. Like if you elect me, I'll put disclosure as as my topmost uh, priority. Uh, the technology obviously is going to affect us. Interactions with uh, non-human entities is going to affect us. This in Basically, everything that makes us human, this subject will touch on in some shape, way, or form. It's going to affect everything. Uh, I think this is the biggest part of disclosure that's going to be really hard is to say, okay, it's not just revealing that these entities are here, but what are the implications of it? What does that mean for us, right? Uh, that we're not the end-all, be-all, that there is something probably bigger than our paychecks and above our pay grade uh, going on, and there's no control over it. I don't think the government or the military has any control over it. They can't. It's impossible. Uh, the inner, you know, we don't know if we're dealing with interdimensional beings, aliens, ultra terrestrial, extra tempestral, all of the above. It could be a, so complicated that we, we're having visitations or interactions with entities of multitude of places. And that's hard enough to admit to only like if the government just came out and said, look, the grays exist. OK, aliens exist. They're the greys and they're here. That's one thing just to admit that one species has found you. But to admit that there's multiple species, multiple bodies, uh, that's different. Right. That's a different ball game because now it's like we can't protect you against that. There's nothing we can do. They come and go as they please. And that's just the way that they've always operated. And we can't do anything about it. Even talking to people inside the Defense Department, they're going through the exact same thing the general population are going through. They're having abduction experiences. They wake up in the middle of the night with three entities at the end of their beds. Uh, they see things. It's We all either have experienced it or we know somebody very close to us that has experienced it that we believe 100%. So we're past that, that point of, of saying, is it real? We all know it is real. At this point, it's discovering what is it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and as much work as, as, as you've read, Mark, and, uh, you know, all these books that we got back there, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Like, we don't know what we're dealing with. It's crazy. It's scary, but exciting at the same time. But talking to people like yourself that just had that shift that's like, well, something you're you're paying attention, Mark. Right. Like something caught your attention. You paid attention long enough. And now you're like, whoa, something's here. Something's not right. And that's what we need. We need more people like you out in the field being vocal and saying very intelligent person as well, sir. Like you're, you're very well-spoken. Uh, you're very intellectual. You've written five books for crying out loud in five years. That's insane. But yeah, we need people like you um, to, to speak up and, and be vocal and say, you know, uh, teach the rest of us to pay attention to whatever your field of study is. We need to pay attention to it because it's part of this whole phenomenon. Uh, that's it for my questions. Louis, do you have any questions for Mark? Yeah, just to touch on that sort of where we all in the in the community anyway, we believe that, you know, disclosure has happened. Recent whistleblowers, David Grush and everything else. It's kind of sparked that momentum. So if we put that aside now and not talk about, uh, oh, are they real? If we just assume they are, what do you think the societal impacts are sort of post disclosure? religious and political because you know that's going to shatter a lot of paradigms for a lot of people especially if you were raised yeah. fundamental and taught that if it doesn't say it in this book it didn't happen and mm -hmm. how do you then you know do you do you think well my parents lied to me or you know god doesn't exist maybe it's just a misunderstanding of that but that's going to screw a lot of people up and even people that or maybe atheists now have to come to grips with the fact that there is some type of creation and you can't just write it off and put it in a box. So any thoughts on post-disclosure societal decay or improvement? Mm. Well, it's really a question about human psychology. Yeah. How, how is it that people deal with new information that challenges their worldview? And this is something I've had to confront myself because I'm writing these books that are challenging paradigms. And I know this because before I wrote the book, my own paradigm shifted and it was uncomfortable. And I hit a wall with a lot of people. doesn't matter how much evidence I show. It yeah. doesn't ha matter how many citations. They don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I often reference the story I, I, of talking to a buddy when I was writing my first book in Into Upside Down Thinking. And I was talking about peer-reviewed papers on uh, the evidence for psychic phenomena, survival of bodily death. 
University of Virginia studying this stuff, US government, all this like really compelling evidence. And he goes, Mark, I think you're probably right, but my life is good the way it is and I don't want to rock the boat. So I'm just not going to go in this direction at all. Yeah. So there, there's an element of that where people don't want to touch it. And there's a bit of denial in other cases where maybe they won't even accept it at all. Um, my view is that in my own life, if we want to understand how to live, it's important to know the nature of the reality in which we live. <laughs> Otherwise, how can we even know what to do? That's my own personal philosophy. So I tend to be open-minded to try to explore stuff and shoot down my own paradigms. But there is this element of discomfort, which I can understand because it's it's not just disorienting, It's um, it takes away the basic stability of one's life to go down these rabbit holes if you're not familiar with them. It means recontextualizing all of one's old assumptions, going back to the beginning of this conversation. So I don't know how that's going to play out in the world. I could imagine some people going crazy from this, of needing psychiatric help to to recontextualize their own reality. And maybe that's why it's happening in a in what appears to be a piecemeal way. Mm -hmm. Because arguably there's been disclosure for a long time. People have been having experiences from a grassroot lens. And We've been getting more disclosure from the government very explicitly. I mean, you could say starting with the New York Times article from a few years ago, and it's like no one really cares. <laughs> That's the amazing part of it. Like People who are interested, they're going to gravitate towards it, and others are going to say, well, I'm just not going to go there or it doesn't affect me. So it might be just part of our collective evolution, and it's going to happen in its own time frame at a grassroots level, but also from a more formal disclosure level. Yeah, paradigm shifts always seem to have psychological effects. And it's almost like our brain knows that, doesn't want to do the work, just wants to keep everything status quo. And for those that are a little bit inspired and want to learn more, it's a difficult pool because I've heard you mention previously, there's misinformation and disinformation. So misinformation could be just an error. There's no ill intent. Just somebody wrote the wrong thing. It's just bad info. So as a viewer, you got to wade through the world of honest mistakes and bad info. Then there's disinformation, which is an intentional act to mislead or misrepresent or confuse. And governments and other bodies are very good at kind of blurring the line and doing both, right? They'll tell a truth and a lie at the same time. And this kind of came into my mind when Jason and I were chatting before the show. But recently, the five eyes, you know, uh, British and uh, UK, Australia, Canada were chatting about what's going on. And somebody from the Australian government said, or, or sorry, the Air Force said that we have not been given anything from the five eyes. So which is true. But the five eyes is a intelligence community organization. Military have their own. So in whispering a truth, they are still misleading you by saying, we don't have any of that info. Yeah, you don't have any of that info from five eyes, but you do have it from other bodies. So by sort of leaving a little bit out, it's disinformation, but yet it's still true what they're saying. And they know how to play that game so well because they know how these programs work better than we do. We take it at face value when somebody from a government governing body says, I don't have it. I mean, there you, you think there's legal implications of that, right? Like, but then you look at guys like Sean Kirkpatrick from Arrow, flat out saying, I haven't been shown anything, or you know, been led to believe that it's anything or any exotic physics or none of that. And then you have other people saying, Yeah, I gave him stuff two years ago, and then he still made those statements. So it's a difficult world to wade through in the world of bad info and intentionally bad info. Do you have any thoughts on that whole? Yeah, no. it makes it so hard to really know what's going on. I mean, I've written a number of books and I feel like I know less at this point. Yeah. I, like scratching the surface doesn't even encapsulate how little I feel like I know. And then I think it's also important to keep in mind things like blackmail. And it's not always a negative intent. You could have someone who's being, their life is being threatened and they have to say something. Otherwise, they're, you know, something horrible is going to happen. So you have these forces at play that are, giving partial truths, they're omitting things. And it makes it difficult for those of us who are trying to get to the truth to really know what's happening. I mean, one example of that that comes to mind is this whole notion of a secret space program. And there are varying theories on that, but then you think of like the work of Michael Sala, for example, and stories like Tony Rodriguez who comes out and he's talking about things like MK Ultra, which there's real evidence for that. And then he expands it to, yeah, I was MK Ultra and I was age regressed and I had a 20 and back and I was off planet. And it's like, there are so many different rabbit holes you can go down and conflicting information within each of those. It becomes very difficult to know. I mean, I've compared it in my book to a, a Venn diagram 
of trying to find the overlap because sometimes you have things that are not verified in other areas and other things that where it is verified by multiple areas, but it makes it such that belief has to become probabilistic. We can't really know for sure because there's disinfo, then there's misinfo, there's intentional disinfo, then there's unintentional. It's like, it's hard yeah. to know. Yeah. And again, it, it's very clear that there's either a faction or a process of trying to discredit people, right? It happened to Lou Elizondo, happened to David Grush. I mean, we were all all for it. And now people are trying to say, well, he's autistic and his body language is like that has anything to do with the information he's been given. You know, like we've interviewed some people that have high functioning Asperger's and they are an absolute genius, difficult to converse with, but give that guy a mathematical problem and watch him shine. You know what I mean? So different people behave differently. And again, he's sitting with Ross Coltard. He knows the implications of what this interview is going to do. Maybe the guy's nervous. Maybe he's not used to being on camera and isn't as polished as the interviewer. But again, there's people using that as a way to discredit him. Also saying that, well, he never really, he doesn't have the evidence. He was just told this stuff. But he also said that I had physical evidence, names, locations, you know, facilities. And I handed that over to the appropriate bodies through the channels that be. So, I mean, that just seems to be our nature of it's either us or it's this sort of shadow government within the government or whoever is trying to make this difficult to grasp. But every time somebody's on a pedestal and, and we chat with Ross Coltart even still, he's been on our show before. And I think Jason texted him the other day and said, man, you kicked the hornet's nest like they're going to throw some stones at you now. Oh, yeah. you put yourself up there. This is just the way things seem to go. And it seems very counterproductive, right? In the, our heart of hearts, we want these people to come forward and give us their story. And then everybody poo poos on them and says, well, that guy's an idiot. And, you know, even Grush, he's probably the most well recommended whistleblower yet. You can back, it's not like Bob Lazar, where it's hard to pin down. Did he work there? Did he go to this school? This guy's vetted, right? He was a combat veteran and then he's been in government programs, UAP task force, uh, you know, NRA, all that stuff. And they still are throwing rocks at this guy. So I think that that's almost a sign for other whistleblowers, which we've heard are waiting in the midst, maybe upwards of a dozen people ready to talk. But there may be some hesitation and maybe some reluctance because they're seeing what happens when these people come forward. Right. And and I think David even said he had to come forward because he was getting death threats. So I think as optimistic as we want to be on this. Yeah. But even then, the, the accountability, that's the part that to me, you know, it really irks me. So if you are a group of people that does that to other people, ruin their lives, discredit them, where's the accountability when it turns out that this is true? These guys should be held accountable. But there's no accountability. They just hide behind, you know, the shadows. And that's what I was telling Ross. Like, these guys haven't gone away. Their tactics have changed, yeah. but they're still going to do what they do. And anything to give somebody just an out, anything, Oh, this guy's got, uh, you know, let's say he's bipolar. Oh, well, we have to discredit him for everything he's ever done. Yeah. What, because of a medical condition? How does that, if he was a witness to a murder, you would still take his testimony as a police officer, right? But now we, we dismiss that. Oh, no, you know what? He shaved his eyebrows once. Let's not listen to anything he's got to say. Like, it's so stupid. We do that because it gives us a comfort. If we say, oh, well, you know what? Maybe he wasn't telling the truth after all. It makes me feel better. I could go back to sleep at night. We need to stop doing that. Even amongst uh, Twitter, I put a tweet out the other day just saying, hey, when people come out, political figures or whistleblowers, support them. Don't attack them. Don't say, well, I think he's full of shit. That does nothing. It doesn't contribute to, like, you're just sitting on your phone like you said, poo-pooing on, on people coming out and, and coming forward, it doesn't contribute to disclosure. You're not doing anything as a Twitter person, just knocking people down. All you're doing is just keeping it exactly where it's always been, right? So we got to start supporting these people. And, you know, like I said, we got their backs like a butt crack. You know what I mean? Like you got to be loyal <laughs> to the people coming forward because that's the only way we're going to make progress is to stick together and not be divided on this issue. Like how, how often Louis, do we get people that just write the rudest comments because they think they're armchair experts and they disagree with the people race. that don't get the message of what we're trying to say, or like people that give bad movie reviews because they didn't get the movie a lot of times, right. It went over their head. And I think, uh, but to your point about, you know, all these people using medical as an excuse, these people are vetted 
to work in intelligence or to work at the upper levels of the good Pentagon, point. they put you through a gamut of tests. So you're good enough to do your job in defense of national security, but now you're a babbling idiot because you came forward. Well, who then is making the bad judgments? You're employing babbling idiots or you're just trying to slander again. We change you know? the rules as we see fit. Right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Before Mark, we go, Mark, where can people, if they want to learn more about you, follow you, your new projects, any future books, where can people learn more about you and your work? Sure. Well, thank you guys so much for having me on. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, likewise. Um, my website is a good place to find me. It's markgober.com, M-A-R-K-G-O-B-E-R.com. All five of my books are on Amazon and you can get them in hard copy, Kindle, or Audible. And my podcast, Where Is My Mind? That's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the major players. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate the time that you uh, set aside for us today. I'd love to have you back. Maybe do a deep dive on something one of these days. Sure. If you uh, if you have any enlightened ideas on things <laughs> or anywhere you want to go, uh, feel Big free to reach out. Big yeah. breakthroughs. Yeah. And uh, we'll turn it over to our audience now. Let us know what you thought of today's show. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed, hit that button. If you like our content, give us a thumbs up. It makes a difference. We do appreciate it. And uh, feel free to message us. Go to our website, UAPstudiespodcast.com. Uh, we will respond to every message we get. And uh, thanks for being a good audience. Like I, I Jason oh, and I rock. say this often. They rock. Yeah. We'll get episodes with 35,000 views and one bad comment. And everyone else is just amazingly positive. So thank you for, for being like our family. And we love sharing these experiences with you. Absolutely. And uh, we're going to keep bringing you the biggest, brightest, and best people we can. So with that, we'll call it a day. Thanks again, Mark Ober. You're welcome back here anytime. And uh, I'd love to chat with you again in the future. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Take care, Mark.